I'd like to say good morning. I don't believe in good morning. That doesn't go together in a sentence in my universe. Um, and because I don't really do mornings, I'm incapable of decision making. So we can either allow our medium to decide what I'm going to talk about, or we can allow the audience to decide. So I'm going to keep you here. Um, which Medium or audience? Audience, oh, God, you see, it's already getting difficult. Okay, I'm going to ask the audience, you're going to judge what they, what okay. they, what they want. So basically, uh, I can talk about um, sex and drugs, um, which is what I have spent a lot of time thinking about over the years. Um, or uh, I can talk about something that I've been thinking about a little bit more recently, because I've been taking some time out from my life in sex and drugs, sadly to travel around uh, Indonesia. So I've done, been doing that for the last couple of years, working on a book. And so now I'm thinking about corruption and conflict. So I take the tools, tools that I use to look at sex and drugs to look at corruption and conflict. So I can talk about either one of those things this morning. So hands up for corruption and conflict. I hope you're... Uh, yeah, I think probably 20, 30%. Sex and drugs? Sold. <laughs> Sex and drugs it is. Fantastic. <clears throat> Thank you. So, um, let's start the morning with Sex and Drugs. <laughs> is a mass murderer. So we're told that ad was from three years ago. Who agrees? God, very few people. This is amazing. Something that, a, an incurable disease that currently infects about 70 million people in the world, and you guys don't think it's a mass murderer. It's interesting. Um, and in a way, you'd be right, because in this country, um, these are just the data for, for gay men, uh, which is the bulk of the uh, HIV epidemic in this country. We'll talk about that. Um, basically, AIDS is no longer a mass murder. It used to be killing on the order of um, 1,200 people a year, and it's now down to fewer than 200 people a year in the gay community. It's about um, three times that altogether nationally. So what happened here? Why did that happen? Hello. Sex and drugs right, drugs. So, sex and drugs, right? Um, so, in terms of what is killing people in the UK, and I've just taken the stats from 15 to 49 year olds, where the bulk of the epidemic is, so that they're. Um, so I'm, using, I'm using the wonderful HPA classifications. External, which kills the largest number of blokes 15 to 49, means what? Basically, it means behaving stupidly. Yeah, it's car accidents, it's shooting one another up, it's gang fights, you know, stuff like that. Neoplasm is cancer, obviously, circulatory, mostly strokes. And AIDS is really a very, very, very small part of the uh, adult death, death picture in the UK. Now, I see a lot of extremely um, young faces in the room. I'm glad of that. Um, and you know, AIDS has become a bit like pubic hair. It's something that most people under 35 kind of know about, but haven't really seen much of. <laughs> um, so, uh, so here's what it looks like. Um, this is a guy called Joseph. Um, the, he's uh, Haitian, and he has AIDS. And he's kind of a reminder in the community of why you might want not to be having unprotected sex. Um, uh, this is another Haitian, uh, also called Joseph. Um, he's perhaps a reminder of why you might want to be having sex. Um, and, and it's the same Joseph. Um, Joseph, uh, who you might want to um, be having sex with, uh, also has AIDS, but has been on antiretrovirals for six months. So it 
it changes these drugs change the picture of uh, the what we used to call the HIV AIDS epidemic quite significantly and that means that it really changes ought to change the way we do treatment so this uh, the way we do prevention so this is how we used to do AIDS prevention in a pre-treatment world and oh God there's almost no one in the room old enough to remember this campaign the grim Reaper campaign um, which was one of the most famous um, campaigns in the early years of the uh, AIDS epidemic. It dates from 1984 in Sydney. Um, what we're doing these days in terms of AIDS prevention is, hey guys, go take your drugs. And you know, there's a lot of, in the United States, where you have direct-to-consumer advertising, we have a lot of ads of people abseiling down cliffs before jumping onto their you know, large uh, yachts and, and sailing in, in the America's Cup. Um, and as long as you take your antiretrovirals, that's what you'll be doing. Those, those ads are always either advertising antiretrovirals or cigarettes, it seems to me. Um, so this really begs the question of how we do prevention in essentially a post-AIDS world, uh, in a world where treatment is widely available. Now, the trope at the moment in the HIV industry is that treatment is prevention. Because treatment lowers your viral load, makes it more difficult for you to pass on HIV, in fact, as long as everyone's taking their meds, that works as effective prevention. Now, I'm sure you all know this, but just you have to understand the viremia um, to, to understand this. So basically, when you first, you can't really get, see, I'm too far away to run my, um, ooh, to run my hands along the slides. But basically, much under those spikes, it's very difficult to pass on HIV infection. So for the most of the time that you have HIV, you're not very infectious. You're most infectious right at the beginning. So you get infected, you start stamping out copies of the virus, your, the, the amount of free virus in your uh, body fluids goes very high before you start making antibodies, and that's when you're most infectious. You start making antibodies, it brings the amount of, of free virus right down, <coughs> and then it bumps along at very low, not very infectious levels for seven or eight or 10 or 12 years before gradually uh, the virus gets the better of your immune system. And now, you have these spikes generally associated with other sexually transmitted infections. Oh, no, no. Can, you know what these things are good at? These things are good at for teasing geckos because you can make them, <laughs> like, think that they're going to catch something. Thank you. Um, so, so basically, if we can cut out those peaks in viral load, then we can reduce transmission. Now, what does antiretroviral therapy do? It brings down viral load. And if it brings down viral load, then does it make you more infectious or less infectious? Makes you less infectious, right. So someone on treatment is more infectious or less infectious than someone who's not on treatment? Less, except that what happens if you're not on treatment? You die. And what's your viral load if you're dead? Zero, right? Your viral load, if you're dead, is zero. So now, I ask you again, does treatment make you more infectious or less infectious? <laughs> and it's a serious question, and one that's considered rather politically incorrect, but it is a serious question. You know, you've got your, your old viremia, and now what we're doing is, if I can use my gecko teaser here, we put people on meds just about here, we're trying to do it earlier, and that brings viral load down. But if you don't have meds, then you're going to die and your viral load goes to zero. So all of this stuff under the green line is viral load that you are out there in the community with that you wouldn't otherwise be out there with, and therefore it creates opportunities to spread HIV. Now, it also means that if you're getting other STI infections, if you're not taking your meds regularly, and which causes spikes in viremia, if you're on first-line treatment that then fails, all of these things are creating opportunities for onward transmission. So if treatment really were prevention, if that really worked, then we would expect, in a country like the United Kingdom, where there's been more or less universal access, free access to treatment for about 15 years now, you'd expect new infections to be going down, wouldn't you? Right? 
I mean, people who need treatment are getting treatment. If treatment works as prevention, then you're getting fewer new infections. Logical? Logical. But what's happening actually is, if we go back to, so this is the stuff we saw before of AIDS deaths. Treatments come in here, so we're expecting treatment now after maybe a little delay to bring down new infections. And here's what's happening among gay men in the UK. Actually, these are new infections. We're seeing a consistent rise in new infections the longer treatment has been available. Now, what that means, of course, every year, for every year that new infections exceed deaths, because HIV is, uh, at the moment, incurable and lifelong illness, it means that you're going to have a cumulative effect of new cases, of, of existing cases, right? So that's your, on a different scale, that's your, tr your new infections, the red line, consistently higher than your deaths, the blue line. And what it means cumulatively is that you've got really dramatic increases in the number of people living with HIV. Okay, and globally, in every area, you don't have to look at this, it's from UNAIDS, it's boring as sin, but globally you can see that in every area of the world now, new infections are exceeding deaths. And that's gonna go on happening because we're doing so well with treatment. So this is, treatment is one of the great success stories of global public health, HIV treatment. Something that when I worked at the UN and WHO in 2000, when we did the first estimates of how much would it cost to really beat this epidemic, the head of UNAIDS said to us, you know what, don't even put in treatment costs because it'll be so scary, and anyway, it's never gonna happen. We're never gonna have treatment for Africa. And so we didn't even put those figures in the estimates. And now, lo and behold, thanks to, amazingly, George Bush, um, we have this extraordinary um, growth in treatment around the world, and that means, of course, that we also have a massive, massive growth in the actual number of people with HIV. <clears throat> so, who are these people? Well, one of the things that happened early in the epidemic was that we said, everyone's at risk. You know, everyone can get HIV, you've all got to be scared, you've all got to use condoms all the time because everyone's at risk for HIV. But in fact, we see very different epidemics in the world, and you all know this, I'm sure. So in Eastern Southern Africa, we're seeing up to a third of all adults, that's one in three people in this room, currently infected with HIV. In other countries around the world, practically everywhere else, it's you know in the one in a hundred, maybe one in a thousand range. Unless we look at specific subpopulations, and if we look at those specific subpopulations, gay men, people who, men, transgenders, and women who sell sex and their regular clients, people who inject drugs, um, and mostly men in prison who tend to, to engage in several risk behaviors, we're looking at rates that are even higher than they are in the general population in sub-Saharan Africa. So um, that's 10 million effect infections around the world, and they are, these are all mates of mine. Um, they, all but one of them has a penis. Um, I've been in love with several of them. I've slept with a couple of them. I was even married to one of them. And these are all people in those high-risk groups. So they are, people who currently or formerly injected drugs, there are people who buy and sell sex, um, and they are um, people who are active on the gay scene. And that's the epidemic in most of the world, including in this country. So everyone is not at risk. We have to recognize where the risks lie. And this is, you know, the thing is that HIV basically is only transmitted by people who have uh, multiple sex partners in that small window when you're most infectious. So you have to be turning over partners in any two or three month period of maximum infectiousness. And you're most likely, globally, most likely to do that are the groups that I've mentioned. Now, this is incredibly difficult to say politically, and it's one of the reasons that we did so badly uh, tackling the epidemic early on. Sadly, the data don't find it difficult at all. Sorry, the colors aren't coming out very well here, so you're seeing numbers up there, but not the whole of the slide. Um, but essentially, so this is from a study in four cities in, in the UK, 
Um, and they went to the same clubs, not even different clubs, and went around and said, are you gay or straight? How many people have you fucked in the last three months? Um, and how many in the last, um, in the last year? And universally, gay men are reporting more sexual partners um, in that time. Surprise, surprise. Same thing with Africans. You're not allowed to say that Africans have more sex partners than non-Africans. That's considered to be racist, which presupposes that sex, more sex is somehow a bad thing. <laughs> Go figure. <clears throat> um, the only people who are allowed to say it, of course, are African respondents to large international surveys, such as these ones. These data are from 1989 and 1990. So we have known for a very, very long time that Africans report, East and Southern Africans particularly, but not exclusively, report far more multiple concurrent partnerships than people in other parts of the world. But we're not allowed to deal with that. So. When you do smaller qualitative surveys, you find that it's not about the actual number of partnerships over your lifetime. It's about the networks of partnerships that you're linked into at any given time, so that you can have 60 partners over your lifetime, and if they are sequential, so, you know, I'm married to a guy, and it's going perfectly nicely, and then he takes up golf, and then... <laughs> He's every Saturday out on the range, and he turns into a crashing bore, so I have to dump him, and then I play the field for a bit, but then I settle with some guy, and that's really nice until he dumps me for his secretary and whatever. As long as I'm only turning over partners once every six months or so, if one of them infects me, the likelihood that I will go on and infect someone else is very low, because my viremia is already much lower. If you're in networks like this, where you only have two or three partners, but you have them all simultaneously, then you're going to spread HIV much more effectively. So, we've known all of this, as I've said, for more than 20 years, and yet we're still doing really badly at preventing new infections. So, what are we doing wrong? One of the things is that we believe our own bullshit. And part of our bullshit is that everyone is at risk and that everything is a risk for HIV. And I wrote a book called The Wisdom of Whores um, about the HIV industry. Maybe it was published in 2008, I think. And in that book, I was joking with some guy from the World Bank, and he was like, oh, God, you know, I just can't bear it. Everything that comes across my desk is women and HIV, fishes and HIV, industry and HIV. I'm just waiting for global warming and HIV. Ha, 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 I put it in the book. Three months later, <laughs> you know, it's amazing what we believe. Mm. Even when we're trying to do the right thing, we very often do it wrong. Now, one of the things that we do wrong is that in the public health world, we, look, we assume that everyone else is a public health nerd. So we assume that people think rationally about their long-term health prospects. This is a real thing that I stole from a conference that, that I was at in Texas. And these guys, very well-meaning, were trying to get Latino gay guys into the HIV prevention community. And they'd identified the problem, which is that STD rates are high among young Hispanic MSM. That's men who have sex with men, AKA gay. Um, so they don't use condoms. They don't know how to negotiate condom use. And so what we're going to do is we're going to teach them to use condoms. We're going to have demos, right? And we're going to do skills building. And then it's going to be fantastic because once they know how to use condoms and they've got the skills, they're going to use condoms. Bingo. Anyone see a problem with this model? Well, apparently, so <laughs> I was making fun of this, um, I think, in a TED talk. And as a response to that, I get a lot of weird emails, and here's one of them. So, think about it. If you were getting hot and heavy with some guy, and neither of you had a condom handy, would you throw caution to the wind and say, let's go for it? No. You'd either put your knickers back on and go out to a 7-Eleven and buy a condom, or you'd say, another night, darling. <laughs> I, I, speak for yourself. <laughs> Just saying. So what we need to start thinking about is thinking about how the people that we, the public health nerds, are actually trying to do something for. Um, so this is, this is take needle sharing. So, you know, a public health nerd, for me, the problem with needle sharing is that it spreads HIV infection. 
for a drug, drug injector, they don't give a shit about HIV because that's something that's not going to happen for 10 years and I'm going to be dead of an overdose before then. I don't want to use, as a junkie, I don't want to share needles because it's really quite disgusting. It's like sharing a toothbrush with someone. You know, you're swapping body fluids with people all the time, but somehow putting their toothbrush in your mouth, ew. You don't do it even with your sex partner. So, so I need, as a public health nerd, to reduce needle sharing, and, and junkies don't want to be sharing needles. So as long as I can provide needles, they'll use them, and bingo, we have less HIV works very well because we have an alignment of incentives. So now let's try those MSM, Latino MSM again. So, <coughs> public health nerd, unprotected sex spreads infection. So what about the gay guys who are turning up to these Latino services? What's their problem? It's actually that condoms suck, you know. Truthfully, sex without a condom is more fun than sex with a condom. That's the thing we're never allowed to say. So, so my solution as a public health nerd is I'm going to, you know, I need to increase condom use, and their solution to not liking condoms is not to use condoms. My action is to train them to use condom use, and their action to solve their problem, which is the condoms are no fun, is not going to suddenly be to use condoms, right? So I'm trying with my public health nerd glasses to push people towards behaviors that are not solving the problem that they face, which is really not very intelligent. Um, so we treat people as though they're morons because they are not um, following our model <coughs> of the way people ought to behave. Um, this is the, from the British Society of uh, Sexual Health something or other. I usually, I have, does anyone know what this is in this picture? Yeah, it's a, it's a spaghetti measurer. Um, now, in the guidelines of the British S Society of Sexual Health, blah, blah, um, they actually say the, the problem is that people aren't using condoms because they're not using condoms of the right sizes. They don't know what size they are. So when a client comes in, measure them up. You can use a pasta measurer for this. <laughs> I am not making this up. I promise you I'm not making this up. You can use a pasta measurer to help your condoms, to fit your, con your, your clients correctly for condoms, and then they'll be much happier using condoms. And you're just like, ugh. But also, we treat people like morons and we say the only message that you can give is you must use a condom correctly every time you have sex. And of course, that's bullshit because different sex acts carry different levels of risk. I mean, we were even telling people to use condoms in oral sex, for goodness sakes. The likelihood of HIV transmission in oral sex, unless you have really, really bad dental hygiene, is between nil and zero percent. But we're not allowed to say that, because does it exist? Yes, we've had eight cases, eight out of 70 million, that we know have been transmitted in oral sex, and I'm still not allowed to say, look, if you don't have a condom, suck it off. No, <laughs> not allowed to say that. People are much more intelligent, real people, particularly gay guys in terms of sexual health, are much more intelligent than public health nerds. So people are using all kinds of strategies. These data are from, uh, from San Francisco, and you've got sero-sorting, which means only have sex with someone the same HIV status as yourself, sero-positioning, which means if you're negative, then top, don't bottom, because being a bottom is much, much more risky than being a top in terms of acquiring HIV. All of these things, people have all of these strategies. Because we in the public health community are not telling the truth, because we are not giving people full information, what's happening actually is that people are making bad decisions. Because there, the biggest strategy here is sero sorting, right? Um, and so that means, okay, I look at you and I think, oh, you're a nice boy, you'll be all right. I'm negative, you're negative, this will be fine. That's the way sero sorting is really happening. So last night, someone asked me to talk about consent, and I think, you know, this is where the consent issue comes in. But we don't ask the sort of questions that we need to to get the sort of consent we need, which is, when were you last tested? Um, and even then, people are making... So people who, who choose sero-sorting as a strategy, it's quite interesting, are very often getting it wrong. So people who are testing really quite regularly 
are quite often infected without knowing it. These are data from New York City, um, and they show that all the people who say they are negative, that's this side, or who say they don't know, you've got, among black guys, over a quarter who are actually positive. So these are people who say they've been tested in the last year and ne are negative. So you pick up one of those guys in the bar, you have the conversation, which is already something quite rare, but you have the conversation, yeah, I was tested three months ago, I'm negative. If that's true, and they are currently positive, what does that mean? It means they've got very high viremia. So in fact, having sex with someone who says they are negative and who recently tested negative, maybe among your, but who's been on the scene a bit recently and who's offering to have sex without a condom, may be one of your highest risk strategies. It's much safer to have someone who says to have sex with someone who says he's positive and is on medication. That's something that we don't tell you because we think you're morons. Now, sometimes. <coughs> You are a moron, and we're not allowed to say so. So these are data from a very, otherwise, a very good um, uh, survey that happens every few years, every four years, I think, in the United States. And it's um, about, one of the things they ask about is attitudes. So these are very stigmatizing attitudes, and you can see that they're, they're falling, which is good. I sometimes think AIDS is a punishment for decline in moral standards. You know, that's a very Jesse Helms view that used to be widely held in the American Senate may or may not still be. And the other one, it's people's own fault if they get AIDS. And we're glad that these stigmatizing attitudes are falling, because obviously it's not your fault if you get AIDS. In an age where information is virtually universal and HIV prevention materials are virtually universally available, obviously it's not your fault if you get infected because it's the fault of, of, <laughs> help me out here, Jesus, Jesus has struck me down. Um, you know, actually, yes, it is your fault if you get infected these days, because you know what puts you at risk, and you can pretty much choose whether to assume that risk or not. And now everyone says, oh, but there are women who, meh, 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 meh. And don't even get me started on the innocent women um, argument. So, obviously, in some cases, you're not in control, but in most cases, you are in control. Except that you're on a three-day tina fuel bender, you know, and even if you had condoms with you, you're... Yes, we're not always in control because we're choosing to do other dumb things, like take a lot of drugs or be blind drunk or, or, or whatever, but that's still within your control. And yet this is not part of the discussion in HIV prevention because nothing is someone, an individual's fault. Now, another reason that we're failing is that we're very selective about our own arguments. So basically, to get a new HIV infection, you need three things, you need all three things, and you need only those three things. And what are they? You need someone who has the virus, someone who doesn't have the virus, right? And an exchange of body fluids between them. So the only way you can actually prevent a new infection is either by preventing the exchange of, the meeting of people who are positive and negative, or the exchange of body fluids between them, or by reducing the likelihood that the person who has it is highly infectious or the person who doesn't have it is highly susceptible, okay? That's basically the only things that we have in our armory biologically. And so we have all of these different things that we do to try and either reduce contact or reduce exposure or reduce transmission. And some of these things are more successful than others. So, you know, one thing that's very widely um, promoted in the United States is abstinence, abstinence-only programs, right? So, does abstinence work or not? Does abstinence work at preventing HIV? If you do not have sex, can you get HIV sexually? No. So, abstinence does work, actually. Abstinence technically, biologically, abstinence works very well indeed. In fact, it is the single most effective way 
of preventing HIV, but it doesn't work behaviorally, right? So then we, so we say condoms work. People like me go out there and say condoms work, okay, occasionally they split and whatever, but really they work much better than abstinence. Well, actually, technically they work less well than abstinence and behaviorally they work nowadays only slightly better. So we're incredibly selective about which of the evidence bases we promote. And I think that that's a dangerous thing to do. And it's particularly dangerous because there are basically four major evidence bases that you have to think about. One, does it work technically? I mean, biologically, does this thing work, yes or no? If it doesn't, then, I mean, that's a sine qua non. If it doesn't work, then nothing else matters. But if it does work, you still have to consider whether it works behaviorally, whether it works financially, and whether it works politically. So it's very easy to stand up here and say, here are the evidence that this works and that works, and why are people so stupid, why don't they use it? Well, actually, very often, we're being really blind to the political um, and the financial aspects of things. So if we go back to that needle-sharing thing, which worked so nicely, um, we actually, if we put the, the, the uh, political part of the equation in there, so I've worked in... Indonesia and China and Bangladesh and the Philippines and many countries where it's actually where we've got big uh, injecting driven um, epidemics and where it's been very, very difficult to put in needle exchanges because basically from the political point of view, needle exchange doesn't work. From a political point of view, there are no votes in doing nice things for junkies. So. If I can make it work technically, and I can make it work behaviorally, and it doesn't cost very much, but I cannot get political support to allow me to do it, nothing else matters. And I think you need, when you talk about evidence-based medicine and evidence-based public health, to think about all of the evidence bases, not just the one that, is, that we like to think about, which is the uh, one that we can demonstrate in randomized controlled trials. Um, so. So AIDS is basically dead, HIV is basically growing, and that's happening why? <clears throat> it's happening because people don't really give a shit about HIV anymore, because HIV is a one pill a day thing. Now what's really interesting is that people care about it so little that they are changing their behavior so as not to avoid getting it. Why? Because now you're that cute guy who has to take his Travada once a day instead of the grim reaper, oh my god, this is going to kill us, I'm going to have to go into a bar with Carposi sarcoma all over my face for three years, and then I'm going to die. So HIV really doesn't matter anymore. Now, is that true or not? I mean, at an individual level, it kind of is true. I mean, there is still really, I've never stood in front of someone, given them an HIV diagnosis, and had them say, oh, right, no problem. You know, when you give someone a diagnosis, everyone thinks it's an end of the end of the world for about three months, and then they start taking their meds, and then it goes back to normal. So as a society, particularly among the groups that are most at risk, people aren't as concerned about HIV anymore as they used to be. And they're quite right not to be, because it is not a debilitating condition in the way that it was. You still have to have the conversation before you have sex with people. It's, again, it's like pubic hair. <gasps> Am I going to tell him before I take my knickers off? Oh, what if he's never seen it before? Oh, you know. but, but truthfully, it's not that much of a big deal. But from the point of view of public health, it is a big deal for two reasons. One, it costs a fortune. So this is from a House of Lords report um, that was published last year. And they're estimating that we're, the lifetime costs of treatment of the number, for the number of people who are currently becoming infected in the UK is about 1.2 billion. Now, that's an awful lot of money that's coming out of our NHS. So we can't afford to allow people to continue becoming infected at the rate they're becoming infected if we want to go on treating them with available drugs, right? So that's problematic. The other thing is resistance. You know, there's a very real possibility that we'll have resistant viruses. In fact, treatment right now is keeping ahead of resistance quite effectively. But there's a, if we get resistant viruses that are transmissible, then we're going to go right back to 1986. And that's a real worry for the public. But it's not such a worry for the individual. And most of the campaigns that we see 
around HIV are all about happy, smiling people, you know, doing really well on their meds. And it makes it very difficult to think about doing HIV prevention in a post-AIDS world. When you get so HIV, it's never just HIV. You're at a higher risk to get dozens of diseases even if you take medications, like osteoporosis, a disease that dissolves your bones, and dementia, a condition that causes permanent memory loss. And you're over 28 times more likely to get anal cancer. It's never just HIV. Stay HIV free. Always use a condom. So that's a campaign that was run by the New York Department of Health um, about two years ago. And they had to take it off air. Why? They had to take it off air because the HIV positive lobby groups said that it was stigmatizing to people with HIV, right? So we are now globally caught in this bind where on the one hand, you want to prevent this thing because it's unpleasant, it's a hell of a drain on our health systems and it may quite easily flip back into an untreatable plague, as it was. On the other hand, you're not allowed to say anything bad about it. Being HIV positive is just fine. Take your meds, don't stigmatize me by saying there's anything wrong with having HIV. So we're really caught in a bind here. You know, from a prevention point of view, don't get it, but there's nothing wrong with having it. And I don't know how to resolve that, so I am going to leave it to you, the younger generation, the post-AIDS generation, which is a lot of people in this room, to figure out how to do that, because we in the public health community genuinely don't know how to do HIV prevention when HIV no longer leads to AIDS. Thank you very much.